Thank you. It's a pleasure being with you today. Um, I have to uh, I have to say it pleased that so many people came out to hear a banker talk about digital because that isn't necessarily the sexiest thing in the world at the moment. But um, when I was nine years old, I started my first company. And about six months after I started my first company, I didn't realize I'd even started a company. I'm nine years old, just started a paper route. But with that paper route came the need to grow that business because within six months, my dad had lost his job. And we needed the money. So my brother and I became the sole breadwinners for the family. And we needed to grow that paper out. So we literally went door to door, knocking doors to grow the paper out. We had to physically go and collect the cash that brought the money in at home. And then we actually distributed them. We grew that one paper out from one paper out to two paper outs to three paper outs. And we started in getting friends and others involved in the actual distribution of this. And I could tell you a lot more about that story. But a lot of what I do today and a lot of what I, what I am comes back from that first time that I created. I created a business and had the privilege of creating something that led to value for my family and for our customers. When I was in college, I then started a sports and entertainment marketing business. Um, there was a fantastic fun ride that led to my foray into financial services. What I'm here to talk about today is how these two worlds of entrepreneurs and large institutions marry together in absolutely magical fashion. I get to sit in the world that bridges between startups and companies spending over a billion pounds a year in technology, companies whose technology budgets equate to or are larger than the entire venture ecosystems in many of the ecosystems globally. But just as a, in way of background, as we look at creating the future of financial services, I would suggest that the financial services industry is one of the next, for the next five to 10 years, is one of the hottest spaces and funnest places to be if you're a disruptor or if you're a creator because technology is fundamentally changing every aspect of our lives. It's changing the way we sleep. It's changing the way we live. It's changing the way we interact with our financials. It's also changing how long we live. A child born today is likely to live to the age of 150 to 200 years. If you start to look at it, what does that then translate into every aspect of their lives, and for me, working in the financial services industry, what that means for how they manage their financial lives, it's fascinating. But as we look at the, how we actually create the future, as people, as humans, it comes down to simply two things. And any organization, regardless of which industry you're in, whether you're a startup, whether you're a large institution, Designing and creating your future fundamentally comes down to two things. Because people, when they wake up in the morning, want to either DIY and the mobile, the mobile phone that I have somewhere in one of these pockets. This has changed the way that we interact in everything we do. It used to be in traditional industries, you'd have to actually physical, physically leave your premises to go to another physical location to engage in something. Then the internet came about, and we were connected through a cable through a fixed premises. And we could do things instead of analog and paper, we were able to actually do them digitally. July 6th, 1996 was the first day that analog went digital in consumer financial services. It's the first day that paper went from a paper application to a digital application through an interstitial banner, through a double click, and then came the AOL credit card application. When 60,000 accounts were generated that first day, we realized we were onto something. But that was, that was only accessible through a desktop. Then we went to mobile. And very soon, we're going to be moving to a world where it's hands-free compute. We will not, yes, we have our mobile devices. Yes, wearables is a really hot, cool thing now. But we're moving to a world where it's all going to be hands-free compute which is another interesting topic. So fundamentally, we like to DIY. 
Our customers like to DIY. But also, it's the power of big data surfaced through a beautiful design and experience that's creating a shared glass experience. So fundamentally, as we look at creating our future, we look at everything we do as to what does a what does what can a person do by themselves versus where do they need another person or another human to interact with them and is it through a shared glass experience or through what kind of experience digitally can we create to make it a richer and deeper experience so that the humans the people are doing what's most important adding value and adding a premium to that service that they can't do themselves both of these two principles then lead to how we're fundamentally learning and creating. This is a picture of my 13-year-old son. I came home from a business trip uh, a couple of months ago. Walk in the door, 10.30 at night. This is my son hammering away on game salad. He, on his iPad, he's got game salad, which is a YouTube-like video training module that teaches him how to create uh, uh, games. He then, in a matter of hours, is able to learn and translate that learning into creation in a, into a game that his seven-year-old brother is then able to play. Go back to that analog model of when I was a kid. I used to have to go take a quarter out of my mom's purse go to the grocery store, drop that quarter into the, gro in, into, the, into, the, um, into the gaming console, play for two minutes, and then I was done. We are fundamentally learning and creating in a different way, and I'll come on to that if we have time a little bit later, as to what that means for startups versus large corporations and this concept of learning cycles and how prototypes are accelerating the pace at which we learn and that we create. Sorry, that's an extension of my son's next, uh, next thing. We now are more digital than we sleep. There's a number of statistics. I won't go through all of them. But the UK adult now spends 531 minutes a day on their digital devices. We're more digital than we sleep. It's become so innate in everything we do and technology is changing everything we do, we need to either embrace it or stand by and be disrupted. Now, let me just give you a, simp a quick flavor as the overall financial services landscape. And just looking within financial services in the consumer space, this just shows that there's lots of growth. What does that actually mean? Two big statistics is it's, it's in, um, it's in uh, payments, and 37% in payments and um, the most common use of digital technology for us as people is checking our bank accounts. What does that translate into and what is that that we actually see within the organization that I work in, Barclays? Our customers, again, going back to that, that maturity of digital adoption that I spoke about earlier, our customers are hitting their mobile applications 26 times a month. They visit this 26 times a month. They visit that, that hardline connectivity through a, either a um, desktop or through uh, a traditional website eight times a month. They visit our branches three times a month. A fundamental dynamic change in the way our customers and people are choosing to interact with their financial services. All of this is really important. But if you don't translate technology into a beautiful experience, it doesn't mean anything. Our mobile banking applications have a plus 70 net promoter score. For those of you that know what a, a, a net promoter score is, that's taking your um, promoters versus your detractors and where do you end up. It's, it's a measure of indicating how much your customers love you. Anything north of 60 is incredible. And our applications have a plus 70 um, net promoter score at the moment. I would suggest that financial services and other industries, many, many, many other industries, are going through what I refer to as the Jason Bourne moment. So um, I don't know how, how many of you have seen Jason, Jason Bourne. Any Jason Bourne fans out there? Yeah? Okay. There we go. So that 13-year-old son that you saw earlier, 
I decided it was time for him to meet Jason this summer. We'd, we went to our cabin that we have in the, in the States, and we, were, um, and we sat down, as a fa- uh, my wife and my son and I, and we watched Jason Bourne and introduced him to Jason. And in the first movie, Matt Damon has just been injured, and the baddies are chasing him, and he, needs, he walks into a grocery store, more connectivity to grocery stores than I'd expected in this presentation today, but he walks into a grocery store and he picks up three things. He picks up uh, something to stop the bleeding. He grabs some whiskey, and he grabs one more thing. Anybody want to venture what it is that he grabs? It's hanging out of his pocket. He grabs a, a paper Rand McNally multifold map. Now, it then cuts to a scene of him navigating the streets of Paris with the map folded over the steering wheel. He's fly shifting while the baddies are behind him. My son looked at this and said, you got to be kidding me. Because he's not used to that. He's used to this. And when I drive him to our, his baseball practice up in High Wycombe at, Roy, at the Royal Air Force Base the first time, this is how we got there. But then, any of you have, uh, any of you have kids out there that geocache? Any geocachers out there? Yeah? For those of you who don't know, and if you do have kids, it's one of the greatest activities to do on a weekend with your kids. It's the world's largest treasure hunt run by kids. They can place their own little treasures anywhere they want. It brings together ma- the magic of physical and digital in a beautiful way. They hide their treasures. This is my daughter. This is the last treasure that we, just, we found. And we geocache on Sunday, uh, on Sunday afternoon sometimes. The kids hide their treasures. They then take one treasure from maybe in London and drop it in another location somewhere else. And the kids are able to navigate through a mobile application that tells them where to go. But what does this have to do with Jason Bourne, and why is that relevant for our discussion? Why is it relevant for other industries? Because the way we create our future, the way we innovate our future, is shifting from more of a closed world to an open ecosystem, what we refer to as C2O. If you look at the pharmaceutical industry 10 years ago, 90% of the innovation was done through big, heavy research and development labs that were captive within their industries. Today, in in pharmaceuticals, 90% of that innovation is done through open innovation. And it's hit financial services, and it's hitting many other industries. So what did we do to embrace this? We We looked at the entrepreneur as the active disruptor and where these emerging technologies are going to be coming from. We looked at the needs of the entrepreneur, and if we, were, if we were to build our future business around and in the way that startups do, how is it that they operate, and what is it that drives them? And we looked at their needs as humans as well as businesses, and we identified 50 core needs. Those 50 core needs um, came together around four key themes. That is starting, funding, growing, and connecting the businesses. But if there's one thing, and you heard the panel talk about this earlier, Sherry talked about the four key needs that she sees. She ta- there, was a, there was some discussion at the end of the last panel about how do you get large corporates to work with startups. And fundamentally, we believe, and I believe, that if you can pivot some of that billion pounds of investment that major financial institutions and large organizations are investing in, and if you can pivot that to be working with the, lar- with the disruptive minds of startups, that is where magic happens. And that's what, I won't, I won't talk about the first three cycles of this, of starting funding and growing. What I will talk about is connecting and what we're doing and where we see a magical opportunity of bringing together academia, government, large corporates, and startups together to create the future of an industry, not just an institution. So. Uh, We decided to do an experiment. We took in a a space that had been abandoned for 22 years. It was referred to as the Herods of the East. It's 22,000 square feet. Refurbished the entire space like a startup would. And we did three experiments there. We brought in a co-working partner in Central Working. uh, We then created and curated events in the space. 
And then we partnered with Techstars, the accelerator program, to, uh, the, uh, to bring in the disruptive startups to help us create our future. In 13 months, we've had 4,000 startups run over 3,000 um, hours of events, 1,500 applications to participate in our startup uh, program. There are other multi-financial institution accelerator programs out there that get 90 applications for one cohort. We're averaging over 500 applications because we're fundamentally looking to become the customers of these startups and in so co-creating our future. But the magic of, and what's powerful and it's incredibly relevant for London Technology Week is that it's bringing in startups from 64 countries around the world. 4,000 startups from 64 countries around the world are convening in London to create the future of financial services. This has been so massively successful for us on multiple levels. We quantify it as a five to one return on investment that we've taken the model and this little, this experiment that we've done here in London, we've exported that to New York. We open our site in New York on July 15th. And that's about all I can say, but I can say watch, watch this space because it's incredibly, incredibly successful. The recipe is there of bridging and bringing large corporates together with startups in a magical way. And it's incredibly powerful, not only for the tapping and the translation of these new technologies, deep technologies like quantum compute and artificial intelligence into the hands of, of customers and the translation of that, but for a large organization that this year, last week, we celebrated our 325th year of existence. The cultural transformation that happens by engaging the startup community is absolutely phenomenal. We now have a series of over 50 startups that we're running internally within Barclays that are replicating the way that startups work, replicating the pace at which they work, replicating the way that they create. If I have time, I could tell you stories about each and every one of the founders of these companies, what we've done to work with them. But suffice it to say, if you come to our external demo day that we have next Monday, I invite you all to come. Seven of these 10 companies will be standing up and saying that in the 90 days that they worked with us, seven of them have either signed contracts or have done experiments with Barclays. The first company to sign its contract with us was done in 66 days. So it can be done for large corporates to work with startups. Now let's pull out of that for just a minute. If you look at where venture funding is going in the financial services space at the moment, about 85% of the funding is going into what we refer to as the P&L, which is payments and lending. Because that's the space that's more actively and easily disrupted at the moment. Once you move beyond payments and lending into the other aspects of financial services, you start to get into that layer of what is referred to as know your customer or KYC, and there's much more heavily regulated requirements. So you can operate in a space under payments and lending that re doesn't require as heavily a regulatory burden, and that's where the massive flow of venture funding is going at the moment, approximately 85% of it. We've mapped the innovation ecosystems globally, the technologies of, where these, uh, of what is percolating where, and this is a nodal analysis that we've done in partnership with Quid, the startup that's actually now six years old in San Francisco. A nodal analysis that identifies from natural language processing where the hottest technologies are bubbling. And to map that globally, we then, part, we then map our locations against that to try and translate those into different ecosystems globally. And I think I had here six, over 6,000 companies multi-billion dollars worth of investments and, and um, significant exits that are happening, happening across each of these major technologies and sectors. These are some of the major technologies that we see that require the translation of amazing, beautiful technologies into experiences that people can either use themselves through DIY or that can deepen 
a human-to-human -human or a person-to-person -person interaction in some way. Each of these are areas that, that um, are of deep focus for us. Um, and with that, I will wrap my presentation because I think I've gone over the planned allotment of time. But let me just then open it up for, uh, for any questions that the audience may have. Yes, just a microphone, sorry. So you've made, you've made a lot of progress. Are there any other inhibitors do you see to making this uh, ecosystem work? Yeah. Um, the question is, are there other inhibitors that, that stop the uh, ecosystem from working? There's lots of inhibitors. There's lots of antibodies. There's lots of large heritage organizations that are attempting to protect their P&Ls. Um, and we need to make sure that we're working with those organizations, that we're working with governments, we're working with academia to bring it all together and that we all have a common vision of co-creation. Because the winners in the future are going to be those that can innovate and, cre and create their future. There's a great statistic that came out of a report, um, a recent report uh, by one of the leading um, consulting firms that says the top innovative firms in the world 75% of their revenues come from products that didn't exist five years ago. So the, need, the fundamental need of organizations to create and co and you guys have all seen those statistics of across the S&P 500, the FTSE, how many of those companies that are on there today will exist in 10 years? Their existence is directly predicated on how fast they can co-create or how fast they can recreate themselves and how fast that they can collapse that cycle time of translating ideas into execution. And that's where the beauty of working like a startup, thinking like a startup, um, can make things happen. Um, but specifically, the barriers for us, um, there are, um, specifically here in London, and as well as in other ecosystems, there are the typical barriers of financial capital and, and human capital. I would suggest it's less about human capital and financial capital. It's more about mindset and recognizing the world's move to a much more open ecosystem, open architecture, open platforms, and there's an opportunity for us to co-create. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Yes, here. Uh, what support do you give your startups other than the physical space? Uh, so there are a number of, uh, number, number of things that we do with our, our startups. The easiest way to quantify it is the startups that come into our accelerator program. But our accelerator program is only one part of what we do for startups in general. Because like I said, we've got 4,000 startups that have just engaged in our local ecosystem um, here. But if you, if you take specifically the accelerator, we mentor them so they connect in with serial entrepreneurs through the Techstars network, the world's leading accelerator program. So they're connected deeply with, on average, 60 mentors that are serial entrepreneurs that help them refine their business. And we have a very structured approach over 90 days as to how we help them through mentoring. We also have over 400 Barclays colleagues that have volunteered their time and energy, some of the deepest experts in intellectual property and governance, governance and compliance and risk in other aspects that mentor them. So mentoring is one big thing. The other thing that we do is um, we actively actively seek to help them grow their business. We focus on how do we help you grow? How do you, how do you refine your story? If you're, in, if you're a startup but you're sitting in front of a large corporate, you got to understand what they're, uh, how do you help them with their story. That's one thing. But the biggest thing that I measure our success on is how do we be become their customer more than anything. That's, that's the biggest thing we do. And then if you step out of that accelerator and you look at what we're doing more broadly in the ecosystem, it's all about curating events and connectivity, creating greater connectivity and a platform for people to be able to connect. We have that in a physical platform today, an emerging digital platform, but you'll start to see a lot more happening in that digital connectivity for startups to be able to scale up, not just within their local ecosystem, but then globally. Because we're a global institution that operates in over 50 con con countries. And because we have deep heritage in those markets, we can immediately accelerate those startups into global platforms, not just local kind of ecosystems. That's a couple of the things we're doing. Yes. What's your perspective on the future of crowdfunding? Crowdfunding. I think, uh, I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think it's still fairly nascent. I think um, there's some inherent risk 
associated with it. It will indefinitely grow. It will grow at a, I don't know if exponential pace, but a, a very rapid pace. Um, I think the important aspect of crowdfunding is to ensure that we educate anyone that participates in crowdfunding. That's my greatest concern around it. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant model. And again, just further reinforces that we're not, it's not a linear one-to-one -one relationship in funding. It's not as closed, but crowdfunding has opened up the funding land, landscape. We, anytime you open anything up, any kind of platform, there are inherent risks associated with it. You have to make sure the participants in that platform, in that ecosystem, understand how it operates and their role in shaping that ecosystem. So I do think crowdfunding's fantastic. I think it's going to grow. I think the biggest thing that I, I, I want to make sure that we collectively do um, as shapers of that, uh, of crowdfunding, um, as individuals, because ultimately it's up to us to help shape that, um, is that we educate everyone on the risks associated with it, the risks and the opportunities. Yes. How, do, how does the bank measure the return on investment um, in the accelerator program, and what challenges is, did you have to get the funding to, or get the bank to put the money in, to, into the program? Let me start with the second part of that question, um, and, um, and that is it wasn't difficult at all because we have a visionary leadership led by a chief executive in Anthony Jenkins who three, four years ago partnered with Dr. Will Hutton from Oxford and Hertford College to set up the Big Innovation Center, which was all about, this was four years ago, all about driving open innovation. So what you're seeing here is simply a manifestation of that vision. Um, that percolates across the organization on our overall approach to creating open innovation. But we also look internally, and this isn't directly tied to your question, but we look at innovation in the three hows of innovation. Open innovation is one. You can buy an innovation. That's how I came into Barclays. We started an internet bank, sold it to Barclays 10 years ago. And then there's the organic innovation, which is how we created Ping It, right? And we look at, how we allocate our capital and our investments against all three of those kind of core buckets across our, our various business units. But how did we secure the funding for this and, ha and how do we measure the investment on this? I said that um, uh, we view it as a five to one return on investment. Um, I'll just give you one of the, uh, two of those metrics. I won't give you the full formula. For every cohort of startups that comes in into our accelerator program, there are 500, say there's 500 companies that apply. Now we can go out and we can work with the big technology partners out there, and we do, and we've contracts with all of them. And they advise us on how to create the future of technology. But at the other end of the spectrum, those 500 companies basically are telling us and pitching to us that they wanna help us create the future of financial services. You take 500 pitches that tells you all about the emerging talent that's out there in these startups. They tell you what their story is. They come and tell you what we should be doing to co-create our future. I quantify every one of those cohorts all the way from the 500 pitches through to the 90 days that we work with them and the tangible deployment of their technology into our business to create our future. That's worth 15 million pounds of consulting, easily. Entrepreneurial consulting, not big recycled consulting that you hear from the, uh, that the consultants are hearing from all of our competitors and then just playing back to us, right? So th that's one. The second is on cultural. You can take a banker that's been in a bank for 25 years and they're brilliant and they know the organization inside and out, but they might feel threatened by this kind of entrepreneurial, agile way of working. So creating a learning and development platform that allows them the exposure in a way that they can dip their toe in and, is, and participate as much as they want. The cultural and learning and development program that comes out of that, there's a very quantifiable number based on the number of people that participate and the level at which they participate in the organization. That's two of the key five metrics that we use to get the five to one return on investment. Derek, you mentioned earlier that you've got an open day on Monday yeah. and you invited everyone to come to it. How do, how do people find out about it? Uh, it's, uh, 
I can get to, I can get the details. You can go to uh, I think it's posted on our Barclays Accelerator website. Um, that you can go there. Otherwise, you can just drop me an email um, or contact me directly through LinkedIn um, or Twitter. It's Derek.White at Barclays.com is probably the fastest way because then my team will action it. But yeah, the, it's uh, it's part of our digital conference on Monday. Yes. Uh, do you have any plans to open these accelerators outside London? Uh, we do have an, um, a physical site in Manchester that launched in November of last year. Our chief executive, Anthony Jenkins, launched in the north because uh, we have the largest technology center just outside of Manchester. Um, we also have a social innovation facility in Oxford that we call The Hatch. Uh, I mentioned we are launching in New York on July 15th. And that's and if you start to see the trend there, but also understand that's all I'm at liberty to tell at the moment. But we are a global institution. I showed you that we've mapped where innovation is happening. Watch this space. Yes. Do you invest in any of the startups that come through your program? Me personally? No, I mean no. the Barclays. Bank, obviously. Um, so uh, the way our program works today is to date we have been, we've kept the investment side of it um, to the side um, because we do basic banking services for 250,000 startups every year start their financial life with Barclays every year right we take care of their basic banking services for these startups that come in we do all the mentoring and that but specifically do we take an equity stake in them we don't our partner Techstars takes an equity stake because to date we have wanted to focus on truly helping the startups to grow their businesses and introducing them to others that can help them with their financial capital um, from an equity standpoint. Um, but that's another one where I'd say watch that space. Thank you, everyone.